You do not need SEO. You need a team that works in the same direction. Start to sell only when they want to buy and share this intention to buy. In this case, you don't need to persuade them. If you hire a lot of people, it's almost impossible to share your ideas. When you share your idea with manager, you lose 25% of information. ChatGPT have a great answers to any question. The biggest problem, uh, can you ask them the right question? The future of emailing is in automation, in AI, but the message, the spirit, the DNA, the value proposition is Hello everyone, welcome to this new episode of the Scale Talks. Today I'm having a chat, an interesting chat, right? With Dimitri, I hope, I hope. With Dimitri Kurdenko, who is going to tell us a lot about email marketing and all the mindset that you have to get to scale a business in that industry. So it's going to be some part of it about emails, listen to that, and a lot of it about entrepreneurship building businesses, scaling businesses, avoiding the mistakes of building the businesses and scaling them. Dimitri, hi. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being here. Hi, hello. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure too. So let's get going. Um, long story short, bit of description. So Dimitri is the founder and CEO of Stripo. And Stripo is an email automation um, platform. He used to be a former developer an IT guy, so that's a pretty specific mindset. We'll come back to that. And he switched from um, IT guy and developer to CEO status, which is not the same the same way of thinking. He's been doing marketing for over 10 years. He has a team of, um, if I understand correctly, 80 people who work directly with you and then three, 400 people in the team. It's a global uh, company. Yeah, uh, there are, I have several notes here. So please first share your information and then I will fix. Uh, uh, okay, so let, let's <laughs> let's just share. Um, and so based on that, oh, and very important, 11 cats and three kids. Oh, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, I found the information. So everything, all this to say, we're going to talk about um, product development, outsourcing a business to scale that business. We're going to talk about gamification as well. We're going to talk about uh, SaaS models and what to think about them. And also a little bit about the future of emailing, which is quite a big topic um, with everything AI at the moment. But first things first, how did you come up with the Stripo idea? What was the, um, the basics? Yeah, but... Please let me first fix some like okay, let's uh, fix. confusion here. Yeah, Stripe is email design platform. So it's a platform where our customer can create a good design, but never can send it. So create email in a Stripe and then export to any system for sending. It could be Gmail or Outlook or Mailchimp, Constant Contact, if campaign doesn't matter. Uh, and we also have a products for marketing automation, and it's uh, called Yespo. But let me uh, try to explain so it's an from integration. the very first. It's a, it's a galaxy of different apps that work it together. It is. I would say uh, I'm kind of serial entrepreneurs, but really all the products I do, they all uh, in MarkTech. So yeah, following the concept, the long story short, uh, I will try to be short. So everything was started about more than 20 years ago when we are together with my partners, organized a company for outsourced software development. So I thought that my call into this world was to write software to do a coding. I graduated applied mathematics, computer science, and all I did was about coding. So, and in about eight years of development, we realized that we know everything how to create products because of, we were focused on enterprise SaaS creation. And we have a lot of experience and we thought, okay, we know how to create products. Why we do products for somebody if we know how to create it? It was one of the, our biggest <laughs> misunderstanding of opportunities, but we started. We brought with several attempts and one of the uh, like most successful was a system, marketing automation system. And uh, we did it for our local business. I'm from Ukraine and all my partners uh, from Ukraine. 
and uh, we did our first uh, product that was focused on e-commerce enterprise. So we did marketing automation, which means we get the data about the user behavior and activate it using any channel, email, SMS, web push. So data plus activation. Data plus activation. You know, there is a modern concept here that's called like CDP, customer data platform. Get the data, uh, keep the data about your customer uh, from all channels you can do. Use it to segment customers and activate in any channel. But you know, in these days, it was uh, 15 years ago, everybody wanted to send a spam. And they thought that marketing automation means deliver the like, promotional message to your audience. And we uh, created the system who's supposed to do personalized communication. But we don't have a market uh, for this because of people don't really understand that they need to do this. And we had uh, three choices. First choice is like uh, change the product for customers' needs. It's maybe most obvious way. Another thing to give up and do another product. It's what we did before. And the third uh, is change the audience because of we we believed that it would be a good way, but how you can change the world around you. So when, when you say change the audience, you mean select another audience or no. do you mean educate the educate audience them. to change the way they think? Yeah. So we had a businesses, e-commerces, but they thought about sending promotion to everybody. And we wrote the tools that have to do the target uh, like communication. And we started to share those ideas. And the first thing we did it's just to sell that we have additional value proposition. You have to transform your business into more modern communication process. It didn't work because of it was kind of sale process, but all IT guys very bad in sales. Hmm. You know, they, they can do create a great product, but they never can do great marketing <laughs> and create sales because of they like solution, not really problem. And it's when I decided to speak uh, from a stage describing the like new values, uh, new ideas of communication. And when I stopped doing the direct sales, people asked me why we are not using your product. You, 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 you say the right things, we love it, you like it. And so you're saying when you stopped selling, exactly. it actually started selling. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, I, I, I really love this process. And from this time, it was my biggest sales point. Start to sell only when they want to buy and share this intention to buy. In this case, you don't need to persuade them about the price, about something. They want to work with you and you can do win-win solution in this case. Uh, but anyway, it was uh, we did it for our local market. It was Ukraine before the war time. And uh, we decided to scale in the global market. But this uh, like relation with the businesses, very hard to scale into other countries. Nobody knows you. Nobody knows you in uh, our neighbor in Poland or here in Portugal or in German. You have to start from scratch. And it was kind of disaster because of, uh, I don't know this language. If in Ukraine I can speak Ukrainian, I, they understand like uh, I am the same as they are, I understand their needs. But when I'm in German, they have a lot of uh, local solution. It's hard to compete. And it was a way when we decided to do uh, like a small trick. In our marketing automation platform, we had the email editor inside. And we said, okay, we want to rebuild it in our product. Let's do it as a separate product. It was an idea to use software as a lead generation for our enterprise. We wanted to create something really great, cheap, to use it as a lead generation. If you create emails in our Stripe uh, and you send email using MailChimp, for example, and you pay us for creating the same thing that MailChimp uh, already has, everybody has editor, then we have a trust. If you have a draft, maybe you would like to send messages with us. So it's first step. And very soon we realized that it was a very bad idea because if we have completely different audience, completely different needs. And we decided uh, to develop the product that was focused only on one thing, 
but this thing have to be done in the best way. So it have to be the best editor in the world. Uh, and yes, at the moment we have uh, we worked on the Stripe of for about seven years. We have more than a million users around the world, and we are number one. And uh, we have a team that focuses and dedicated only one one problem: email creation. And it helps our marketing automation system because of our editor embedded into marketing automation. I promise it to keep the story short. <laughs> so. It's answering for a question how we came up with the idea for creating a Stripe. So just because of we let, didn't have let any me choice. ask the question again. Okay, I'm asking the question. So how did you come up with that idea of creating Stripe? <laughs> yeah, uh, really because of we like the way when we uh, create a product that focus only on one problem, hmm. <clears throat> and that uh, can be a product led product. You know, when you don't need to sell, to scale globally. So from the very first day, we create a product uh, that has a users in all countries around the world. And when we can find, uh, like, understand what to do based on their behavior, not because of, not, not based on uh, some customer who pay you more, because of it's always tricky thing. So the point in what you're saying is that it's not a matter of having a great idea and trying to scale it. It's a question of having an idea, but looking for a real problem. People have that problem, so you have a solution to match exactly that problem. And then once you have that, you use the data to confirm it. And then you scale based on that data that shows there is that problem that matches yeah, your solution. Absolutely. Thank you for the definition. And uh, can I share this book with the audience? There is, I, I really like the book, Fall in Love with a Problem, Not the Solution, mm -hmm. by Yuri Levine. And uh, he showing exactly the same concept. First, you need uh, to understand that you have a problem. And it's not only your problem. It's uh, like problem for a lot of people. And you cannot find a solution for this. And then you have to think how to resolve the problem. It could be uh, in this book, uh, Uri Levine, uh, it's, it's a person who wrote the Waze application, Waze navigation application. He wanted to reduce number of traffic problem in the world. And he thought, okay, if, if we have a social network when people can say where is the traffic, when uh, and other, so it can solve the problem. Mm. He hate. He was in this studio a few weeks ago, actually. Yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, why I didn't know about this. <laughs> well, well, we'll have to come back. Um, one thing you said when we prepared that discussion was it's important to talk about an idea because there is that stage where you think you have a problem, so you're building a solution to solve that problem, and you're like, if I talk about it, people are going to steal my idea. And that's kind of a myth in entrepreneurship, like this is my idea, I have to protect it and not talk about it, but it's bullshit, let's call a spade a spade, and your point was... Yeah, uh, exactly, yeah. I don't agree. Yeah, I think when I have an idea, start to speak about it from the uh, first day, maybe even earlier than you have an idea, because of when you speak, you can validate, is it a real problem? I think that the most important thing is to validate idea as soon as possible. I will share my secrets here, because of uh, we have a development team, we can do everything. But for a lot of money, and we can waste our time trying to mm. implement all, all the stuff. And when we do one thing, maybe in this day we don't do another thing. Exactly. And before you wait till you create your proof of concept or MVP and start your marketing to have the first feedback, you can share idea and discuss with the uh, you know, target audience and understand something before you start to solve it. So just to explain, proof of concept means you have that idea and you're trying it. MVP is the basis, uh, minimum minimum value proposition. So it's the first product without the makeup. It's just something that's basic, but it works and you can use it to test it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what I did before we started Stripe, uh, I had like a road tour uh, to uh, just prepare the list of uh, agencies who do email marketing. It was in several countries. I just uh, planned the tour and visited all those agencies and tried to participate on some meetups and conferences. 
I spent about two months do these travels, but when I returned, I have a full uh, my uh, yeah, notes of, uh, of ideas, uh, and some of them we still implement. But first, I was inspired, and people knew that I will do something interesting. I already had a network of people who support me. Because of some of them was, so why why are you sharing this information with me? Because I, I can do the same. You know, okay, I, you can do, do but it. I can do it uh, for my money, for you. You can use it even for free. Or if you want to do it, just do it. Actually, there are two points here. One is an idea is great, but it's worth nothing because what matters is the implementation. I have an idea. I'm going to build a rocket to go to Saturn. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can have that idea too, right? But we we don't have a way to put it into place. So it's just an idea. And when we have a new idea, the first one is gone. And the second thing is more like a, a question. It means that when you're building that business, the key is to have number one, um, long-term perspective, long-term vision. And on a daily basis, you need to think very short-term and bootstrap everything. Right? Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's a mix. There is a lean concept. You should uh, receive uh, the feedback from the system. Build, measure, learn. If uh, you, when you decide to build, uh, start to learn from this. When you have uh, to learn, when you have a real product, when you have uh, all these uh, waterfall stages for planning, testing, implementing. You know, I have a concept in my uh, company for content. Uh, we uh, provide a lot of uh, articles about emails, how to build email, how to make emails. And I have a rule, like a pu pu publication principle. If you start to work on some content and if it's not published, it means you did nothing. If you have an idea, but uh, it doesn't work uh, in real life, it means that you don't have an idea. Definition of done, it has to be published and you should get the information up from it. It is very important. You know, my internal mission in a company, uh, like uh, internal principle, I want to build a company where uh, ideas never die uh, by his own. So I, if I have an idea, you need to I should it. do this. It can be uh, died, but only because of something happened. Maybe it doesn't work. Maybe it's a bad idea, but not because of I didn't do it. Yeah, because in the end, even a bad idea is going to get you to the next idea. So exactly. it's not just just wasted time. The yeah. wasted time is if you have the idea and you don't act on it, right? Yeah, yeah. Even if, if I don't have resources to do this, I have to find a way to validate it. Maybe find the partner who will do this. But idea should never die in our company. So it's it's a tricky thing to build such a company. So that's a very good transition to my next question. Um, I know that you gave me an interesting definition last time um, of what you felt was the, the two aspects of organic growth. And you said organic growth is um, one, being an expert, or at least at best, pushing people to recognize that you are an expert. That's not the same. And two, having a constant strategy. So expertise plus content. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. You know, if you uh, if we decide that the first validation of an idea is just to speak to people, then maybe the easiest way if you write your publish your idea in your blog or in your social network or in somewhere and have the first feedback. Even if you don't have a comments under the blog, people who understand the problem would contact you directly and you organize some meetings and you have a friends and you have a network that uh, helps you to think in the direction. Sometimes you have some links, oh, see, uh, this guy did what you said. Mm. Okay, okay he, uh, he did this. Uh, like now we're doing AI-generated AI emails. There are so many tools that generated emails. And uh, I published all my ideas before we implemented this. And they have so many links, ideas, uh, somebody who want to discuss it with me. And it's where I met another big, big, big problem. How to write uh, like a book. Uh, because of if you have a team with a good uh, like uh, experts in your team and ask them, okay, 
Uh, in two months, uh, I need a book about gamification in email. And they start to work and we'll do it like, like in the program, uh, IT in software development, like a planning, some, some very big strategy. And at the end, we will have a deadline with the result. And what I found that I always uh, have not, not good enough results. So I always unsatisfied because of uh, when I have the uh, book, I give the feedback, it's completely wrong because of they don't think deeply, maybe because of they didn't have a feedback in a way of development. And we decided, okay, we should build a concept. Uh, I called it from note to a book. When note is some thought you can publish not longer than in two days. So you have idea, you structure the idea, and you publish it. When you have several notes, it's combined into article. When you have article, you can scale it, adding more quotes, more numbers that prove it, more cases that prove it, or rewrite in different formats, like in presentation, in a webinar, in some guest post, uh, or something. And the next step, uh, you add the product solution. So first is research, then you understand that you know how to solve the problem and you add small product solution. When you have a product solution, you start to get your own cases. And after that, you can build kind of book. For me, book is small dissertation. So from note to a book, a lot of stages. And each of them is uh, iteration when you uh, have to add additional value every time and have a feedback every time. And you don't need to always understand what you will have at the end of your journey. So it means that in the same way that you were explaining before that building a product is about starting from the problem, checking, 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 learning more, validating, learning, learning, and then building something after the MVP because we know it's working and it, it's a product market fit. You are using that logic of lean and also the scrum logic for the, the IT building techniques. Yeah, uh, because of lean is not methodology, it's philosophy. And philosophy cannot be only in software development. It has to be in a mindset. It's a mindset. Yeah, and in marketing uh, and in a, uh, your entrepreneurship mentality, in investment, in everything. And so you're using that also so there is the building the software, building the solution, that's one thing. But the same logic applies to how do we build authority? How do we start with, okay, an idea, we research the idea, it's multiple ideas, and then multiple ideas gets, get us to some piece of content, and then the piece of content, we're going to repurpose it, and it's going to be a talk there, a video here, um, an ebook there and an Amazon book somewhere, which is not the same as a, a small ebook for marketing purposes. Yeah. And so that's how you're building this, the, the thinking side of the scaling. Yeah. And also it helps uh, like uh, one of the mission uh, of us, uh, of products we do. We do the product that change the world. It sounds like very uh, like optimistic or I don't know what I can do ambitious. to change the world ambitious. in email marketing. It's, it's very ambitious. But what I found that it's so easy, it's so easy to change the world in any, in any place. In email marketing, for example, I think uh, we were the first who implemented like a modular email uh, uh, structure. Before this, nobody did this. And now it's kind of standard and one of the biggest trends. And uh, there are some things that we did first and now it's a standard. And it makes the world better for email marketers, not for everybody. And maybe for everybody because of everybody starting to receive better emails. Like accessibility. You know that two days ago it was uh, International Accessibility Day. Uh, so, and... Uh, 99.9% uh, of all emails uh, not uh, fit the basic accessibility uh, like rules, restrictions. And uh, so we can help here. So all emails create is accessible. So, you know, it's easy, uh, but I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, that's okay. But um, here's another question. How do you work? What's your, so one, we were saying building a product is about being strategic in the process, lean kind of logic, 
Scrum kind of logic. Okay, we apply the same logic to building the strategy, being the building the spirit and the, the storytelling um, behind the brand. Okay, how about building the differentiation? The, the Stripo in the middle of the digital marketing space is just one tool. Um, you said you can use it as one planet in the galaxy, let's say, but it can be combined and integrated in other options. How do you build the differentiation in a scaling approach without being just replaced or replaceable? Yeah, I see. When you found the problem, Yeah, and when then you uh, decide about solution and then validate it, is it a good solution or not? For me, the good solution is a solution that change the user behavior in other like pattern of user behavior in a way to go in the level up. Because of if you just copy your competitors for the solution that they're trying to solve, maybe you will never differentiate. If you feel that you uh, let me let me give you an example in email uh, email creation it's so easy uh, evolution of email creation first it was a plain text then it became html and uh, started uh, maybe you saw like in a google doc like visa week editor when you select like bold like do formatting then for creating branded email it started to have like drag and drop editors when you drag and drop buttons images text into some layout what you see is what you get kind of thing yeah uh, but yeah uh, what you see is what you get usually it was uh, when you write html and highlight but for emails it's much more complicated because of a lot of email clients a lot of restriction and regulation mm. so they started to do this drag and drop and uh, i say okay why uh, all emails i created looks very bad and all emails are created by my designer looks good I just don't understand all these principles of uh, proportion, of uh, colors, of uh, fonts. I just think about functionality, not about... I, I'm very bad in the good-looking things. And I said, okay, I don't want customer to drag and drop bricks, like a button and text. I want them to uh, operate with a content item, like a blog post uh, or um, like promotional blog or like a footer or header uh, that in, in one concept. So the marketer should think not about the technical stuff, but about the strategical stuff. And uh, why they don't do like this? Why email marketer write a code inside email for automation? And uh, everybody want to solve the problem, how to make it easier to do. I want to remove this because of marketer should do marketing but not development and integration stuff. They should think about the message to the audience. But what they do, they, they do SQL requests, they speak with the development team, they write some for each cycle in HTML. They have to understand what is HTML. I think it's a problem that yeah. nobody wants to solve. I said, okay, if they would use not bricks like buttons and text, but whole content items, and I will create the biggest library that is uh, like brand consistent and we can control this brand consistent and design then it will be different ways they will think okay uh, then it is uniqueness but what if somebody would do the same as you it's uh, where i came up uh, with ideas sharing your ideas what if your cast uh, your competitor will do it earlier than you do and what i found for myself That first, if I have so many, I have a very tough roadmap for the next two years, definitely. If somebody will share idea with me, I have to remove my priority into some ideas. I don't know. I'm not sure what is this. Uh, maybe I will not do this till it's my idea. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that my competitors are very busy with the ideas as well. They have a pretty uh, tough work to do. And... If my competitors will do things in two months after me, it's the same if they do in two months before me. Nothing happened. Let's look into ChatGPT. ChatGPT was a leader and it's still a leader. But uh, now we have a Gemini, uh, okay, image creation. Mm -hmm. We have a Dali, we have a Midjourney, we have uh, Leonardo, we have a lot of AI models who operate with images. 
And it doesn't matter if I have new one that creates better than Dali, I will use it easily, maybe cheaper, I will use it. I'm not a very big fan of uh, like Microsoft or uh, mm. some other company. Uh, I just need to solve the problem. And now, in nowadays, it's not very important who was the first. It's much more important who do a better in a strategic way. And our customers, I think most of them with us, not because of we have uh, the best functionality, but they understand our philosophy, how we look, they sharing the ideas with us, and it's why they stay with us. So that's an interesting point, actually, because usually differentiation is about, well, first, the, there is the first mover advantage, which means accessing market, getting rid of the, the existing barriers, right? So you realize there is this problem to access the market, you get rid of it, you get rid of it, you get rid of it. But then there is the point of building the barriers behind you. So you got rid of whatever was complex and then you rebuild it after you to make sure the other guys are not going to try and steal your concept or the way you're working. But your point is, it's okay to have multiple things. It's more important to have one philosophy, one vision, one big thing that relates to the brand and the users are going to be loyal to the brand anyway. They're not going to move away to the next guy because they believe in what you're doing. Exactly. I, I think it's exactly the thing. Uh, especially if you're not in the very big uh, venture when you have uh, millions of funds and you have to the first and run as fast as possible. If you do bootstrap and all our companies we do bootstrap and all bootstrap uh, companies you should have return money back. You cannot always invest. Yeah? yeah. And if this, so you're doing kind of business startup, but business startups that starting to generate your uh, return of investment f as soon as possible. Uh, like Uber. Uber was uh, with negative cash flow for years and years. But everybody spoke about Uber because of they created different way. Uh, they removed somebody from the chain of, of interactivity between the driver and uh, uh, passenger. Yeah. So they change the user behavior pattern. I think it's important. If you don't change anything in user behavior, then you will compete with the quality of uh, some features and you will never win, I think, till you understand something specific. Yeah, it's all about the specific. Um, next point, we I promised, see, doing what I'm saying, I promised we'd be talking about the, the SaaS model and uh, the innovation, not behind just the software, but behind the model, right? Um, you had a point that was about, okay, we're building a service, which is good, but there is a limit. And we're building productization, which means we have a product, but we have to industrialize it. Can you come back on that two points, uh, kind of concept of service and productization? Yeah. Uh, you know, we started from a service company, which is uh, outsource development thing. And then we decided to do a product uh, like uh, our Sputnik, yes, for in a global market. Sputnik is uh, for our local Ukrainian market. And uh, Yespo is a solution for global market. We'll put the links in, and, in the uh, description. Yeah, then we have a Stripe or Retain or Clasp, or we have a lot of products like this. But, you know, how outsource work, how service company works. What is the capitalization of a service company? All you sell is yours. If you uh, like your expenses more than you get, have money, you will lose this money forever. So the biggest problem for outsource is a bench. If you have uh, some employees uh, with a big salary, they don't do a real work. It means uh, you uh, you lose money forever. It's not just you will return it. When you do something in the product, you think that this feature will uh, give you a lot of money later. If you cannot sell uh, your hours, you lose it forever. Uh, so when we have a hybrid way, when we have outsource and we have a product, we can use some developers that can have in a product, which helps. Also, when our uh, developers uh, do uh, something for our customers. They're not just doing the code, they understand the business uh, and the product needs because of we build successful products for our own. It's kind of value proposition. 
we know how to build products for us so we can help you to build it for you. And uh, if we need some special, maybe temporary usage uh, expertise uh, that we have in our team, we can use it. So one business supports other business. If we would not have a product uh, side, uh, then uh, driving the service side will be much harder because of we cannot use our bench resources. So we just lost money. But so it means you're making a difference between the people side and the product side. The people side is difficult to scale. So you have a system, which is we outsource and we get what we need. When we need, we get the talents for a time, we get the ideas for a time, we get whatever um, based on the need. And then the product size is about capitalizing, as in, in the same way that you're building a, a building. Yeah. The thing is going to stay and you can keep improving and you can keep improving, but whatever is in there yeah. stays in there and it's going to keep building value. And you're differentiating both, which is a good point because it, usually when we're here to talk about scaling, right? And when we talk about scaling organizations, there is always that thing, which is kind of ridiculous, that the bigger the organization, the more people you have in there that are pointless. Yeah, you know, we... To be honest, uh, I never wanted to have a big company. Yeah, it was another thing from the numbers you said in the very beginning. Uh, in the top, in a group of a company, we have about 350 uh, employees or teammates, uh, and I never wanted to uh, have a business where which grows when you have more employees because of it's hard to share the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to. Organize. Mm, to, to organize. And, you know, first time when I realized when I'm in New Year party uh, that I I cannot understand who these people here, uh, who says uh, hello to me. Uh, and they say, okay, maybe I'm not very good, uh, like, manager or owner when I don't know the names of all of them. Maybe it's good, but I don't, don't want this. I want to have a small team that do the best service is the best product uh, that can be scaled not by number of people but number of servers uh, that i can turn on somewhere in amazon in the cloud because of uh, hiring the people is very hard especially now it was at least you worked with people in office but after the pandemic yeah uh, right. people went uh, online and never returned back and when they wanted to return back uh, in ukraine it's the war started and mm. A lot of people now distributed around the world and even they just cannot go into the office because of all this uh, crazy uh, things happened. So, yes, how to scale your business? One point here, it's, a, it's not a question, it's just a, an idea that I'm giving to illustrate that. The point is, at some point, you, you need to increase staff because the company is growing. But also, because you increase staff, you have to increase staff. Yeah, because you have to find the managers for the managers and the top managers for the middle it. managers. And yeah. there, is a, there is something that works every time. If you want to remember that, it's uh, remember Julius Caesar. Yeah. And he was the emperor yeah. and he had generals. And the generals, they had centurions. Yeah. And the centurions, they had decurions. And it was this idea that every time you have 10 guys in a team, you have a manager. Yeah. And every time you have a new manager and you get 10 managers, yeah. you need to have a super manager. And so technically it means the more your company grows, the more team it needs and the more management team it needs as well to just support the how much you're hiring yeah. and it becomes crazy. It, and so unless you start thinking about that, the scaling becomes a nightmare, right? Uh, yes. And uh, to resolve it, we're trying to build as horizontal as possible. So we don't want to have this vertical hierarchy. Uh, everybody can uh, ask me and, uh, every, uh, and I can ask everybody without speaking with his manager, yeah. uh, which is very important uh, because of uh, uh, in lean concepts, there is a waste and one of the waste is handoff. So when you uh, share your idea with manager, you lose 25% of information. And when your manager shares the idea to another manager, another 25% of information. And when as a very as a person who really executes thing, maybe he executes the wrong thing. It's what I understood when I worked in outsource. 
if you would only know how many the good ideas I spoil because of I thought communication uh, channels is it because of communication channels I thought that I did my the best I always persuade that I have a good idea but I just didn't realize that the manager shared the idea of his uh, owner in a wrong way to me we, uh, so what I want to say especially for uh, growing the company for outsource when we only started till we were 20 or maybe up to 50 we had no overhead at all. We didn't have a recruiting, we didn't have a legal team, we didn't have a, like a office manager. We managed it all ourselves. And we had only the people, we speak in the same language. But when the company grows, you realize that you have HR teams, head of HR, recruitment team, uh, and then legal team, and then... <laughs> so... so does it mean that in the end, so on, on the one hand, you were talking about organic growth, right? So building the product, talking about the product, building the brand identity, making sure people connect with the brand so they sign up, but then they stay loyal. To be able to sustain that, you need to build capacity building, right? You need to have the, the staff, the servers, which is the, I like your definition of scalability, um, looking at the number of servers, not the number of people. Does it mean when you're building and you're preparing for that organic growth increase, are you thinking in terms of um, aggressive capacity building or are you thinking in terms of smart capacity building? Yeah, smart capacity building. Yeah, because of, you know, uh, it's a storming, forming, performing uh, stages. And uh, when even if you hire a new person, everything changes in whole atmosphere. If you hire a lot of people, it's almost impossible to share your ideas and your culture mindset. You just do something that uh, people think is more efficient, but it's not your idea. Maybe in one day you would see that it's not your company because of they, they manage in a very different way. I felt this uh, when uh, we had an, one manager, uh, another partner, and he had a different mindset. He uh, he understands how to manage people in very, uh, not aggressive, but very exact way. So everybody has to track every minute uh, and uh, report about all KPI under pressure all the time. And uh, one day I found that uh, on the planning meeting, people do not report. So they really report and think. They're not sharing the problem. They're not sharing on support, they're reporting and trying to protect themselves. I say it's like a corporative mentality. Mm. And uh, I, I, every time I, I really disappointing and like uh, became crazy when I feel the signs of corporative mentality in our company. For example, when uh, we agreed on some budget for paid advertisement, we have the budget and it's agreed. Nobody would blame if it's used in the wrong way. It doesn't work. Everybody sees that it doesn't work, but we have a budget. It's okay. Oh, please use ten thousand dollars in different way. It doesn't work. Uh, but you know, if you have a corporative mentality when you need to agree something and you have to protect from mistake, it's it's not a startup. But it's uh, yeah, that's the point. It's uh, the, the the mindset is very corporate, as in. I'm protecting my butt in case I don't want to be kicked. Or as in a startup mode, it's more like it's teaching to the teams that what we have to do is try and measure and then invest, but it's okay to fail if we know that we are actually failing and if we're changing the direction. Yeah, exactly. Especially when you track the time. Okay, you're tracking the time to, uh, I don't know, to find me if I don't spend enough time. No, I track in the time to understand uh, our processes where we spend uh, time not efficiently. And not because of I want to pay you less money, for example. Speaking of mindset, so we said earlier that you started as an IT guy, right? And I believe I, I'm still an IT guy, but uh, nobody believes in it anymore. The way you speak suggests you're still a little bit of an IT guy, <laughs> but okay, it's, it's not the major part, right? But Still, IT people have a specific way to think. CEOs have another very specific way to think. 
And usually you don't really see the CEO talking to the IT guy unless the CEO was an IT guy, right? And they understand exactly. each other. How did you go from one to the other? And to make my question a bit more specific, because the point is that people have to be able to use that. And usually the question is, how do you go from being freelancer to CEO? So that's the mindset that goes very differently. Freelancer is me, myself and I. CEO is everyone else but me. How does it work in an IT kind of context? Uh, you know that entrepreneurship and IT is uh, uh, in a, uh, two parallels. Entrepreneurship is in your mindset. Not everybody has to be entrepreneurs. And it's very good that not everybody has to, have to be entrepreneurs. It would be a mess. It's still a mess, but some people are much more uh, comfortable uh, doing work they uh, ask to do, but they just love to do this work and not and sleep well at night. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, IT think uh, is uh, IT mindset is when you can do definition of things, understand the problem, and uh, define uh, the solution or what could be criteria of definition of that. And it's kind of IT mentality, I think. IT is not about writing a code, it's just a kind of mindset. Understanding and acting. Uh, yes, yes. And you know, uh, you have to build the team that can speak with you in the same language and have to be balanced as well. Men, women, so different mindset, different, different ages. It's important, but they all have to understand the same language. For example, when we hire people, we uh, like ask some mathematical, uh, mathematical problems to them and logical, not necessary mathematical. And for me, it's not very important for them to answer uh, correct. They just need to think, and if they do mistake, they have to understand that they are mistaken. Apply this and try another idea because of what I see that somebody mistaken and they stick on this mistake and cannot go another way even if I prove that it is a mistake. Or some people go to the right direction, but I try to give them alternative solution and they're not ready to understand this or decide, that, okay, uh, maybe I'm mistaken. They're not very confident in the results. They cannot see in the real numbers. It's a bad thing because if we're trying to build a company uh, like a data-driven, data-driven, it means that, yes, you can do something based on your intuition, but you have to validate it with a number. Practically speaking, it means on your iPad, you just wrote one half plus two third. And you would be asking someone what is the, the total of that? No, no, no. It's and not, people... not really. Uh, this uh, one half and two third. It's uh, I also have this question, but it's just to understand that people. I don't know why. It's my personal problem, to be honest. It's not nothing about the business. I just found that eighty percent of people cannot answer to this question, but everybody knew in a school why this knowledge lost. But in the end, the point of asking the question is not to know if they know how much one half plus yeah. two third is. It's how they're going to react to that. And if they're going to say, OK, I don't know, I wasn't good at math, or uh, I think this is this, but it could be something else. What you want to know yeah. is how they react. Yeah, solution, solution doesn't matter. Uh, some people said that, OK, if I have a pizza and it's more than one pizza, so it's uh, like... Uh, or somebody did it in a liters uh, of alcohol. I don't know. I had this uh, way to mm, <laughs> to solve. If that was beer, <laughs> there would be nothing left. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's yeah. my it's, it's a, Yes, it's a good thing. <laughs> so doesn't matter how much uh, we will have empty bottles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, and it is a good thing as well. At least you have some framework to solve it. So it doesn't really important uh, on the numbers, but you have understanding on the user mentality because of maybe some numbers you, you don't get in account. I, I have another book I really like, which is uh, uh, Dark Data, uh, I think, Dark Data, yeah, that most of the data we don't see, but they have a very big impact on the result. So can we get an account data that we don't see? What if someone says, um, let me look at ChatGPT and I'll give you an answer? Is it the the thing as in this. the guy is going to look for an answer or is it like mm. red flag because the guy is not going to think in terms of data and is just going to get whatever chat GPT is giving? To be honest, uh, I, I'm waiting for this case. Nobody did this. 
maybe because of an interview, they I thought, okay, why you cannot uh, ask the question, uh, answering, the, but it's kind of cheating. But yes, it's cheating. But if they would say, can I ask chat GPT? Maybe it's okay. And we will discuss with him. So important thing. It's not about entrepreneurship, maybe, but chat GPT have a great answers to any question. The biggest problem, uh, can you ask them the right question? Like Albert Einstein said, the most important, if I have a problem, 80% of time I will do about the question. And the question became much more important than answer. Answer you always can get. But what have to be the question? And I see uh, it's again IT mentality that most of the people cannot define the right question. It's where we would discuss this problem with our uh, candidate for interview. How about the shift from this to the CEO mindset? Okay. To be honest, I don't know what is a CEO mindset. It's the same as entrepreneurship mindset with your partners. All our employees, I look to them not as an employee, but as a partners. And we all do the way together. Uh, the CEO mindset, it means the person should have very good uh, vision. Mature is a person who have a vision and dream and fall in love with a problem. So not the solution. If I want to solve the problem, I will do it every day. I will discuss a lot of ideas because of I have this problem. And uh, who is CEO? CEO is a good leader. Yeah. CEO is a person who lead whole team around this vision. Formally, it's a person who hire, who gets the money for a team, who manage people. Uh, but it's about leadership for me. First of all, it's about leadership and uh, consistency. So it's a person should uh, go forward even if something going wrong trying to find another solution. The weak CEO is a person who do management. Only mm. management. He knows what is the best practices. It's a person who implementing best practice. It's bad CEO for me. But sometimes it works when you do not a startup. It's when you do something uh, when you go the way a lot of people already went. But when you're doing startup you're always in area of uh, something new, something you never know what will happen. And you should have a vision. The point of the vision is an interesting one because um, most CEOs have it in companies that scale because they know they can't do without that vision. But when I talk to entrepreneurs who start or entrepreneurs who are in the launching phase with only a small team. Yeah, got it. The answer is always like, vision is bullshit, man. I don't have time for that. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the vision is only important thing here, but you don't need CEO for me. Maybe it's a wrong uh, way for a lot of people, but you do not need CEO. You need a team that works in the same direction. Why you need CEO? What is the difference between the product manager and CEO? What is the difference from the developer and CEO? No, you have to write a code, uh, I am uh, your boss. It doesn't work like this. When you're in a small team and when you're doing a startup, everybody do everything. Yes? And if you need to raise the money, a uh, whole team working for this, uh, usually it has to be one responsible for this. But it's not usually the person who trying to find the money is not the person who leads the business. Who is CEO? It's the roles. And in a small company, don't think about the roles. Think about the problem and what you can do the best to solve the problem. If I can write a code, see it and write a code. If you can do marketing message and create a site, do this. If you uh, have to organize some financial structure and reporting, do this. There is no role CEO. CEO, you need for investors. When say, we have a team, we have a CMO, CTO, so, and to say, we have a well uh, structured team. But for real product, you don't need to have a team, you don't need to have a CEO. Another point, um, it's a parallel to that. And we've already talked about it when we were talking about lean and all that. So somehow we're going to rephrase, but the word is important. We talked when we prepared the discussion about hypothesis and the importance of building hypothesis. It's a big point in the lean mentality, in the lean startup mentality, right? Still, when I talk to people and I say, what hypothesis have you built to develop that business or to justify that you're going to invest 100 grand in that part of the project, what are the hypotheses? They say, what hypothesis? What are you talking about? That's not your point. Uh, you know, hypothesis is a very tricky thing. 
We all speak about hypotheses, but how to validate it when you have only started your product? If I have hypotheses which, I don't know, message works better, how many validations of this message I have to do? For example, I created a two landing pages and do A-B test, yeah? And with one message and the second message, I have 1,000 traffic here and 1,000 traffic there. And one converts eight, another converts 12. Does it mean that one is better than other? No, because of its statistically uh, unconfident. So you have to understand how to prove your hypothesis based on numbers. But to have the big numbers, you should have a lot of traffic, I don't know. And a traffic with a, with a good quality audience. For me, uh, hypothesis is just to feel when you speak with your audience and you understand that they, they have the same problem. It's just, okay, I met, uh, I spoke with 10 different, I don't know, uh, like my personas, the personas representatives, and eight of them uh, resonate this problem. Maybe uh, I need to do something. And then I have to return back and to revalidate this. And then again, revalidate this. You never can say this hypothesis is validated, especially when you only start the business. So it's not a point of saying I'm doing A, B testing and A is B is better than A. No. It's about first saying, let's see if A and B are actually making any sense. And then we test if one is better than the other one. But the first element is the hypothesis, and the first element is going to talk to people to see if it's making yeah, any sense. Maybe without uh, hypothesis one, you have hypothesis zero, and that's all. You just check, works or not. You don't need to have as uh, alternative. Mm. Is it a problem? Is the traffic jam is a problem in the case of Uri Vine? Is uh, uh, time for creating emails uh, is a problem for Stripe? Is uh, uh, IT guys, so marketers cannot do good looking email without designer. Is it a problem or not? Do they care about this? Because of when we started with the problem of time optimization, we found that nobody cares about it. Nobody. Because of I spoke uh, with the CMO of a big company. So I, I paid for this. I, I paid them to do this work. I don't want to uh, care about uh, saving 40% of their time. I'm not I paid anyway. I paid anyway. Yeah, they, they do this work. Uh, I don't want your software, okay? Uh, if it's not a problem, what we are doing? Uh, maybe we uh, use this time for some other most important thing. Maybe marketers should love us because of they don't do the work they hate. If they would love to write the code, they would be programmers. But they love to right. work with the message. So let's do what you love and focus on the work you want to do and you learn how to do in the university. The rest of the thing we will do. You don't like to read all the blog stuff, how to write emails that looks like a corner button in Outlook or versions. Don't care about it. We will care about it. So it's completely different thing, saving a time and make marketers do marketing. In your own job, so we'll rephrase that in a moment, but in your own job as the CEO um, and in the way you coordinate everyone, manage everyone, not micromanage, but macromanage. Do you feel sometimes like you're alone at the top or you're on your own and it's difficult to navigate the team and, and come, come up with decisions? How do, you, how do you manage that and what kind of advice can you give to the, the people who have to make decisions on a, on a daily basis? You can have this only when you stop to speak with your people. If you uh, live in your bubble, Yes, you will have in, in your own context. Especially, I, I feel this when I go for my business trips for a long period of time because of they're working hard on some problem and I'm visiting different uh, conferences, different people, different lifestyle. And when then I return back and trying to share and they not in the same concept as me, the only reason speak more often. I think like this. Yes, and never do the vertical structure. You How about have a manager and have somebody who implement your ideas? How about routines? Do you have any routines that you use to <laughs> build up your your own framework, your own efficiency, yeah. your own well being? When we only started, uh, I had very interesting situation when I was asked to do a task. When there are a lot of routine thing, we, it's just boring, and I delegated it another person who uh, was stuck on it. He just didn't want to do this because of it's very like monkey work. And uh, we said, and I said the phrase this time, any work you can do 
interesting for yourself. Maybe it will cost you more, but any work you can do interesting to love this work. And we said and automated this work. We, we wrote something uh, that is not required, but it automated all this routine thing and uh, then scaled. And then we did completely different, something different. It's even some solution happened. And now I started to speak it always, all the time, the same thing. Uh, any work you can make interesting or you have to delegate to the people who love this work. If you like it, keep it. If not, delegate. To people who love this work. Who love it. Okay. Because of otherwise, it would be the big problem. Uh, you just uh, do the, this shit is not for me. Uh, do this work. Figure it out. Yeah, figure yeah. it out. Uh, it means that your employees is not important for you. It's a wrong thing. You just have to sit together and maybe just keep it. Just maybe don't do this. You just need to understand how uh, is it a big problem if you will not do this? Uh, for example, some reporting stuff. What happened if you will do, not do this reporting? Or if you automate this? What happened? What is the risk? And in the lean, there is another waste, is the defects. Do you know what is the definition of defects? Definition is defects of the uh, maturity of a defect. So it can be a life uh, critical, or maybe just UX critical, or maybe it's some minor stuff. Multiply it on the time this problem was not detected. So if a small, t a small thing that was not detected for a long time, it can be a huge problem. If it's a huge problem that uh, identified almost immediately, it's not a problem. Uh, it means that uh, how big risk if you will skip this work? So, for instance, if we say um, there is a UX, so user experience problem, and we say the risk of it is number one, well, it's from one to ten, it's very small, so it's one, but it hasn't been detected for 100 days, so the value of it is one times 100, so the, yeah. the, the risk is going to be one. Can I give you a very simple example? Uh, I get the user behavior, yeah, uh, from and have the, the uh, browser, a local of the browser, just to understand the language or IP or something. And something br was broken here, and I don't get this information. If it doesn't work week, okay. But if it doesn't work for a long time, one day I would decide that my segmentation or, or something, I just cannot use it just because of I cannot get it from the log. Just no way to fix it. So the tiny thing can become the big problem in one day. And uh, if I did some, it's not just a UX problem, maybe a salary calculation. So uh -huh. just to come back to the numbers, if that problem we identified is a one value, but we haven't detected it in 300 days, then in 300 days, that's going to be a 300 kind of value problem. So it becomes a big thing. Yes. Whereas if we detect something right now and the importance of it is number 10, it's going to be 10, but two days, that's 20. So in the long run, we can solve 10 now because it's now, but it's just 20 in two days, whereas not yeah. solving the, the error number one is going to be 300 in a year. And if we wait even more, it's even bigger. Yeah. Uh, like in IT world, usually you do automatic tests. So if you broke something, you know that the test will find the problem before you release it. So it means that uh, it, uh, the time uh, to detect it was zero. So even the big problem with zero time for detection, no problem. No big deal. But if it's released, it can be a problem. And it's important uh, how much time, and maybe, it's important thing. If you release, it's a problem, and you still have a developer who can fix, it's okay. But if you released, then and it was one week, and this developer went to the holidays, and uh, you lost the context of this problem, it means that to fix it, you maybe will spend months, which can be a huge problem. So the time is important in this equation. I have two more questions. One, uh, is about you, and the other one is, I think, is going to be the wrap up. Um, first one is about you. How do you describe yourself? Are you an entrepreneur? Oh. Are you an IT guy? Are you a CEO? You said no. Are you an educator? Are you what are you? Uh, usually, uh, I like describe myself like uh, I'm a, in a software engineer uh, who became entrepreneur, but people know me as a marketer. But uh, I uh, feel myself like entrepreneur. Entrepreneur means uh, you uh, can wear any hat. You can do, if you want to do the coding, you can do coding. Uh, if you 
it, it just person who always trying to solve something. It's a person who uh, all, who cannot stay where he is at the moment. Have to always run. And I think uh, entrepreneurship is the best word that explains. So yes. Do you ever get tired of always running? Uh, you know that some people uh, when you know when when you do buy do any sport like a bicycle or something. Yeah, some people enjoy running uh, and and relax in it. I cannot. I can enjoy uh, and rest when I do bicycle. It's okay. So the movement and the action doesn't mean that you're tired. Sometimes you're having a rest doing some actions. And uh, I hope I will never stop. When I stop, it, ah, by the way, it's an interesting thing. It may be, uh, I, I have always offered to sell some business and start the new one. Okay, uh, we, can, we will buy it. What I will do with this money? Uh, you will start the new business. But I need new business if I already have one that I love. It means that uh, I would like to stay with it till I love what I do. If one day I decide that I'm tired, it would be the day when I will think to sell the business because of uh, why I need to do something I do not love to do. I don't want to wake up early morning to do to solve some problem. Maybe uh, I hope it will not happen soon. <laughs> but who knows? Uh, I love this idea that I don't want to stop. I love this idea that I want to go to a rock. So, so you're an entrepreneur who's also an educator and an IT guy occasionally with some marketing skills and you don't want to stop about it. Every entrepreneur is educator. Because of education, uh, for me, it's not to teach somebody, it's just to speak and think in a discussion. Yeah. Or sharing ideas to see about the reaction. Uh, or maybe find some friend in friend in problem, if it's possible to say. Somebody who cares about the same thing as you. Understand. Uh, so it's not about something I would want to be a teacher in a school to uh, teach people uh, like children. But sometimes I like this as well because of speaking with the children. It's a very, very good thing to understand, to repeat to yourself something, to rethink about. You know, a very quick story about me. Uh, I was, uh, I don't know how the teacher or professor in university. I did post-graduation. And uh, then uh, there I have a discipline uh, where I explain some uh, high mathematical stuff. And only there I realized why uh, I uh, like learned it two years ago in university. Because of before uh, saying this about you know, 10 times, then I realized something new, something different, and starting to adopt this in my business today, which is very strange because of a lot of people, uh, for example, from my experience uh, in, from universities, they don't use this the, the knowledge they have in the future work, which is strange, like with uh, one and a half and two and uh, two third. So why people don't remember how to summarize uh, the numbers? They did it every day in the school, then every day in the university, and then they forgot how it happened. Yeah, because they don't use it. Why they uh, spend so many years yeah. uh, using it if you, they don't need to use it in the real world? I will share uh, the book. I don't know how the right name in English, uh, How Not Be Mistaken. It's a, a mathematical book, how uh, to adopt a mathematical problem in the real life. And... There are so many things how to apply mathematics in the real life. So it if we summarize what we've been talking about, quite, quite a few things. Product development, outsourcing to scale, having long-term plans but being able to bootstrap on a short term, building organic growth, building a brand, differentiating it, productizing, capitalizing on what we're building to, to avoid burning the cash without reason. We talked about mindset lean a lot, the importance of uh, building hypotheses and finding the right people and all that, right? Um, you can look at the, the video again if you want a summary. But last question, um, and I'm coming back to your field expertise. We also promised uh, a quick discussion on what's the future of emails. Oh. 
What's the what's the advice you would give to people who are thinking in terms of okay, what what the heck with my okay. email strategy? Where where are emails going with AI and everything? It's very dangerous area, you know, because of it's <laughs> it's kind of my passion. It's I spent years for this, and so uh, we're going I will for try to be hour, guys. <laughs> yeah, please. Sorry for that, but <laughs> I will try to uh, be short here. So. The question about the future or about future of email? Where where is it going? Is it is it the market for the future with AI and everything that's getting very artificial? Yeah, uh, you know, in the different market, the future is in different point because the future is how your position will be changed uh, across the time. Yeah, and uh, what I found that here in Portugal, a lot of people don't do the basic stuff and. Um, let me share very quickly the uh, concept with you of processes in email marketing. When we only started, I wanted, I really wanted to create a map where in this map I can say uh, you're here and it's your way here. Because of in the lean strategy, uh, you, I, I hate to write the strategies because of the world is changing too fast. And uh, once I was asked to create strategy and I wrote the strategy. It was more than 100 pages of like a book with some investigations, the rules, the examples, competitor analysis. And I sold this book. They paid me for this book and even printed. And then I realized in one year they, they did about four pages, five pages from this book. And that's all. Why I spent the time, even if I got the money. So I did nothing. And so, okay, I don't want to write a strategies, but I have to have a vision. So you are here and I know the point where you have to be. And uh, about several years, I worked on this concept of this map to keep it as simple as possible and to put any business into this map and say, you have to be here. And uh, one of the most important things in this map was your understanding, how deep you understand your processes in email communication. And I got the concept from Aikido, uh, Shuhari. Uh, Shuhari is a three level of understanding uh, knowledge. Level Shu is a level of best practices, is a level of following rules. You can have the things checklist implemented. And the next level, uh, is a high level, is when you break the rules. When it's from virtual art, you don't, uh, you, you understand that it's a wet here, or he has a knife you have to run, or maybe <laughs> uh, your arm is hit. You don't, you cannot do this now. You can do something differently, not just following the rules. And the real level is when you build your own rules. So uh, three levels, uh, follow the rules, break the rule, and build the rule, be a rule, create new rules. And what I found in the email, then uh, the most money you have in the shoe level when you just implement best practices. You even cannot understand this, but just do this. The next level, ha, is a level of experiments. You do what works by uh, uh, experimenting with different best practices. And here you can even make result worse, but you spend more time for this. But you learn something from your audience. And then when you change something, understanding something from, from your audience, you can have another, uh, like a jump in the money because of you understand something new, real level. So most of the company uh, here I speak, they don't implement the basic. So uh, the future for these companies just to implement the basics. But what I think would be from whole industry, the future of whole industry of human marketing. Uh, is AI, certainly. AI will change a lot. Uh, but in case of marketing, nobody knows your audience better than you. It means that it would automate routine work. Uh, and marketers would never, I think, create the real, real email. They would manage the message to audience. So the way that I know what to say you in uh, your funnel, so I know that uh, I have to onboard you, explain about our product, and they have special offer for you to convert. So I have messages for you. And the system will decide uh, what message has to be delivered in which channel, uh, what time is better for you to send, how many touches, in which way to build this, uh, maybe as a part of email, or maybe text messages, or maybe in your mobile application, or web push, or maybe uh, just 
through the call center. So a different way. Now all system of marketing automation, they implement the way, follow the instruction. So they wrote very exact workflow. Send email, wait one day, send another email, wait till the next Monday or something like that. But you can say, I have what to say to this person and system can choose in which way this message has to be delivered. Then marketer would think about the message, not about the technical stuff, background, transport level. So the future of emailing is in automation, in AI, as far as the automation is concerned, but the message, the spirit, the DNA, the value proposition is human based on marketing, yeah. ex marketers experience, not marketing, marketers experience and, and business positioning and yeah. business positioning. Because of, uh, if AI can solve all problems and you will have only the button, uh, get more money, uh, how you can be different from other companies? Yeah. So you started the, the Stripo experience based on the idea that people wanted to spam and it was a question of educating them on not how to spam but how to build value yeah and that was 20 years ago and the future of emailing is still in stop the spam shit think about your message uh yes i'm thinking about it uh, but uh, i think much more personal communication than it was earlier days uh, and can we return, not to my story, but we spoke about the formula for the problem and the solution. And uh, Uri Levine was here, yeah? Uh, and uh, when one day he created a ways that uh, was solved as one of the billion and four, I think, or billion and two problem years ago, one of the first uh, unicorn, he was asked, okay, uh, you build the system for preventing traffic. But now much more people went to a road because of they, uh, they don't afraid of a traffic and you have more cars in the road and you have more traffic. It means that you create a product to fix the problem, but you make the problem bigger. bigger. And he thought, okay, uh, maybe it's true, but if uh, I uh, help people uh, to go from one place to another and feel more confident uh, or just do more than they can do without my application, then my goal is, this goal is much more important than was the previous one. So he wanted to solve one problem, but as a result, who came up to another problem, the bigger problem. And here, uh, the same. Uh, I try to uh, do more personalized patterns for creating emails and people start to send more emails and my inbox full of emails that is promotional emails. My yeah. idea, is uh, to minify uh, this spam traffic. But sometimes uh, it means that uh, people subscribe for more services and have more emails. And it's on, not only the system who's sending emails uh, 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 responsible, but like a Gmail. Mm -hmm. Did you see what they did? They did promotional, primary, social, like uh, folders. Structuring. And in promotional, uh, you can show uh, the best offer even if it, if it was sent two days ago, it's not only ordered by time, but it also have a value of discount. So they understand your behavior pattern. They understand uh, your intention to do something. Everything is changing. Infrastructure is changing. The way we communicate is changing. There are so many email killers. Uh, first, it was uh, like, if you remember ICQ, ICQ was uh, I remember email. remember that app. <laughs> yeah, it was email killer. Then social networks, it was email killer. Uh, nobody would write email. Then uh, it was uh, WhatsApp uh, or Telegram, or it was email killer. But nobody killed email, email still uh, survives. And uh, now uh, in the business communication, the Slack. So I'm spending more time in the Slack than in email, but I still yes, have yeah. email. And uh, we had a web push, you remember? Web push is another email killer. But, uh, you know, uh, when I had a lot of web push, I have to structure it in some way or keep the history or blah, blah, blah. And then I have came up with the mail again. So uh, channel doesn't matter. We are not about email. We are about the communication. And if one channel dies, another channel appears because of people still need to have a communication. And we are thinking how to make this communication personal. And yes, it's a big problem to minify spam in our inbox 
and what we can do to make marketers easier to send messages. Do you know why we have a spam? Do you know that? Do you think that marketers want to send a spam? No, they want to deliver the message to the people who would buy. They don't want to send message from to, to somebody who will never see it. Yes. So we have to create the environment uh, to connect the customer with the people. But with all the GDPR and current uh, current strategies, they have to be uh, connected implicitly. So uh, we have managed the permission to send me a message. But it's all about emails. So scaling an emailing marketing automation business takes a lot of spirit takes a lot of passion, takes a lot of organization and being smart about how, what you're doing. Takes a, lot about, uh, takes a lot of looking forward and thinking in terms of what the hell is coming next. Without revising everything all the time, you have to keep the big picture. And it's a game of patience. Is that it a good is. summary? Yes, yes, it is. So you don't need only to... Uh, Again, I don't know why uh, this session is all around this book, uh, Full in Love is a Problem. Uh, but usually what startups do, if they validated the problem, and if they found the solution, they started to do the solution. And after that, they stopped to look around the world. And uh, it's very hard for them to read off the solution. It's the wrong solution because if you can solve this problem in a different way. You don't need to do all the stuff. Just solve it in a different way. And to do this, you have to keep uh, open-minded. Yeah, But still don't switch your ideas all the time because you will never get a success. For me, what I do for this, I, uh, I visit in all, uh, all conferences in my industry around the world, not only in my country, uh, just to understand what other people think. And not following these ideas, but just trying to keep all and structure in my head and then structure to my team and be open to stop doing something and trying another solution. I'm not sure uh, you read the book Three Body Problem that now is Netflix series. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't see the series. I read the book. I think in series it have to be the same. So it was a game when they observe the problem and try to explain how it works. And it was a different approach to do this. One, just uh, intuition. Another uh, problem, just trying to feed what they see for their solution. It was one of the biggest uh, problems I see in the world. And another, it just observe and change your solution for the problem. And it was the right solution. So different ways. And startup have to be open-minded uh, to understand the problem and the solution and f don't follow up with a solution. It's what I do always because of a technical guy. And if I invented something, it's very hard for me to stop doing this and doing some other thing, which is strange. Thank you for your time. Thank you. You know what to do, right? Scale your business, scale your mindset. Make sure to follow the channel and we'll see you on the next one. Yeah, and can I uh, also give uh, some uh, advice? Just do. Uh, do what you dream to do. Uh, even if you do it in a wrong way, you will learn on it, but it's better to do than not to do. Yeah, thank you. And write me a message if you want to know something. See you next time.